But here we are, guys, and the Lord, He can use anybody. He can speak to us. He can, and, and if He can speak to us this morning, then all the glory to Him. So, um, and you know, a couple of weeks ago, I shared about uh, just having our eyes on the Lord, how we just need to have our, hear from Him. You know, it's easy to uh, take our eyes off of the Lord and have our eyes on people, have our eyes on situations, but to have our eyes just on the Lord and to just hear from Him and just to have that foundation in our lives where He is everything, where my, my simple relationship with Him is, is everything in my life, right? But there's one struggle that we all have. We all have it, and it brings discouragement. It brings, can bring condemnation. It can bring confusion. It can bring frustration. It can bring anxiety. And it's one thing that we all can struggle with. It's other people. <laughs> other people. We can be serving the Lord. We can just, Lord, you do, you, whatever you want, you do what's on my heart. You put what you want me to do on my heart. And someone comes along and says something to us, and it derails us. And it, and it makes us take our eyes off the Lord, and we put our eyes on people. And so often we want to put people in a box, and we want them to stay in that box. Or people put us in a box, and they want us to stay in the box. Or we put expectation, or they put expectation, or, or whatever it may be. But we can have our eyes on people, and it's, it, it doesn't end well, guys. But if our eyes are on Jesus, then that's where they need to be. And it's one thing to have a good relationship with the Lord, but it's another thing to carry the heart of Jesus for his people. And that's what I want to share about this morning is having the heart of Jesus for other people. You know, Jesus came. He died on that cross. He says, while we were still sinners, he died for us. We didn't deserve it. He, when we feel his heart of grace, we, we, feel, we feel his heart to forgive us. We feel his heart to restore us. And it's wonderful for us. But somewhere he wants to develop in us more and more. And I'm the first one to say I need this. I'm up here just sharing what the Lord's put on my heart. But I need this more than anybody. Trust me. But to have the heart of Jesus for other people. To, to forgive. To, to bear with them. To even be falsely accused. To be rejected. And to say, Lord, forgive them. Don't charge it against them. And I just want to turn to John 13. Because at the end of the day, Jesus is the author. The Bible says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one who's writing the book of our lives. And I'm on chapter 1, page 3 maybe of mine. <laughs> and you're on chapter 6, page whatever. And the Lord is writing his, his book, which is your life. And who am I to say, what are you doing on that page? Why are you going through that? Why are you handling that? But the Lord knows how he's writing our lives. And we can't look at each other and have, want to control each other. But, but encourage each other to serve the Lord. And I believe there's a, there's a direct link in our relationships with other people, a direct link when we're well with Jesus, we're well with other people. When we're not well with Jesus, when we're, when we're, when we're turned our heart from him, when we're struggling, it's hard for us to be well with other people. So in John 13, it says, A new commandment I give to you. Uh, 34, sorry. Uh, 13, 34. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Right? He says, love one another. And what is love for us? You know, my wife, I'll get her chocolates. I'll get her, you know, get her flowers. That's how I, you know, is that, is that true love, you know? And even brothers, we just help each other out. You know, I love you. I'm helping you out. But the love of Jesus is different. It says, in 34, it says, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And we can think about how has Jesus loved us? How has he loved us? How he's laid his life down for us. He's given his life for us. He forgives us. He restores us. He's so quick to, like the, the, the father and the prodigal son, to, when we turn our hearts to him, to run to us and to restore us and to bring us back into his home. That's the heart of Jesus for, for you and me. And that's, this is something that Rod actually shared on Thursday night, too, which encouraged me. But that same verse that, as I have loved you, that you would love one another. And there should be one aim in every one of our relationships. One goal, one aim, in, no, matter, no matter if it's, uh, we're brothers and sisters in the church, no matter if it's husband and wives, no matter, if it's, no matter what it is, there should be one aim and one goal of any relationship, and that is to point each other to the Lord to point each other to serve him, to point each other to do his will, to point each other to walk in his plan and to walk in his ways and to just point each other 
to the Lord. That should be the number one goal of each one of our relationships. And if it's not like that, then it becomes emotional. You know, you, you got to do what I think you should do, or it becomes manipulative, or become whatever it may be. But, but that should be the aim of every one of our relationships. And, you know, we have our lists. We have our big lists of people, you know, they, they offend us, and we put it in a little, we write it down, and we put it in a little file, and we store it away, and then we, they offend us again, and we put it in there, and, I, and pretty soon we got like a book. Austin, yeah, Austin, oh yeah. And then when Austin does something bad to me, I pull that file out, and I said, oh, remember all those other times where you, yeah, you remember that again, you know? And it's so easy in our hearts to pull these files out of, of offenses that we carry from people. But somewhere how the, the, as we go along and we'll go slow and we'll trust the Lord to speak to us and trust the Lord to speak to me, but somewhere if we can see this morning the heart of Jesus for us and how he wants us to have his heart for other people. So uh, the first, there's a few little areas I just want to touch on. And the first little area, like I said, was emotional relationships. Where I, I'm wanting you to do what I want you to do. Not what the Lord wants you to do, but I want you to do what I want you to do. Or I want to come and I want to protect you from, the, from what God is doing in your life. You know, sometimes we're in the fire and there's people who say, just get out of the fire. Just get out of the fire. You don't need to be in there. You're a Christian. Just get out. But in fact, in that fire is where the Lord is refining us. In that fire is where the Lord is, is, is doing something where we walk out and we no longer smell like smoke and, and we're not even burned like those three men in the fiery furnace. And when we walk through and we go through the fire, he's burning away things that, that are in our lives that don't belong. And the fire is, is where we need to be. And it's a good place to be. And sometimes there's people who come and say, don't, don't be in that fire. Don't, don't, no, it's okay. The Lord doesn't want that for you. But the Lord knows what he wants. And uh, I remember, you guys know Chloe. She, my daughter, she loves pets. Absolutely loves animals. I mean, she, when she was like two, she used to go pick up like lizards from the sidewalk. And, she, and I'd be like, oh, what are you doing? And she's just like petting them. And we'll go to the farmer's market and There'll be a dog, and the lady be like, oh, no, she doesn't like kids. And then pretty soon, Chloe's, like, holding the dog, and, like, you know, and the, and the people are like, she's like the dog whisperer. What is that, you know? But she loves animals. And so when we came here, moved to Florida, they've been wanting me to get a pet forever. You know, the kids are just, let's get a pet, let's get a pet. And we can't have dogs because we're renting, and we're not allowed. And, uh, and so I decided, let's get two goldfish. And let's see if we can take care of them. And let's see who actually does take care of them. Is it going to be me or is it going to be them, you know? So we go to the pet store. And I go in there and I tell the lady, I say, I just want a bowl and two goldfish. That's it. I'm trying to get out of here for like 10 bucks because these things probably aren't going to survive. So, <laughs> so I go in there. And she's like, no, if you want goldfish, you've got to have a 20-gallon tank and this special filter and this and that. And I'm like, what? And it's going to be like 200 bucks. I'm like, what happened to is that just in the movies where they have goldfish? I don't know what. So, so I went and I looked around and I found like a, a little bowl thing, had a filter in it, and I just said, just what can I put in here? This is 20 bucks and I'm willing to spend that. What, what can live in here? And she told me these neon tetra fish were, which were like $2.50 each. The goldfish were like 10 cents. So then she's like, you have to buy five of them because they can't survive alone. They, they, they just, and I'm like, oh, so this is like adding up real quick. <laughs> so anyway, I'm like, it's okay. I just bought it all, it cost me like 40 bucks. So. We left and we're leaving and we're in the truck and we're driving home and Nicholas has the, the fish tank on his lap and Chloe's got the fish in her, in her lap and she's, she's naming them. This one's Dave and this one's this and this one's that and they're all, oh, and I'm like feeling like super dad driving and I'm happy, you know. This is great, great day. So we get home and we do everything right. You know, we set up the tank, the water, everything's perfect, the food, the pH, everything. And we put the, put the bag in the water so it can acclimate to the right temperature. And then we take the fish out. You can't pour the, the water from the bag in because it has ammonia in it or whatever. So you got to take the fish out and with the little nets. So we did everything perfect. And uh, then we're going to go to dinner. It's like a Saturday night. So we're going to dinner. And as we were leaving, the kids went into the car. And as we were leaving, I look. And one of the fish is like swimming into the current of the little waterfall. And then he's like kind of floating like that. And in my, moment, in, my, in my head, I'm like, Oh, he's just having a good time. Maybe he's just having fun. You know, he's like, he's swimming, and then he's just, oh, yeah, he's having a good time. He's enjoying himself. But then as I walked out the door, I was like, probably not. Okay. And so, so then I went, we went to dinner. We came back, and um, Chloe runs in the house. And she runs in, and I come behind her, and I'm like, what, what's going to happen here? And she's, she's there, and she sees the fish, and she goes, Dad, look at They're all sleeping. And I was like... And she's like, shh, be quiet. And I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. They're like, yeah, they're sleeping. Oh, so go put your pajamas on and that's okay. 
So I told Julie, and I was like, okay, <laughs> this is what we need to do. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., I got to go because church starts at 10. At 9 a.m., I'm going to go to Petland. I'm going to buy five more fish. You can distract Chloe. I'm going to put the new fish in there. We're going to put them in, and then, and then everything's going to be good, okay? And then if that has to happen again, we'll do it again. You know, I'll do that for, I'll do it 20 times if I need to, but I don't want her to know that these fish died. I don't want her to know. And Julie looks at me, and she's like, Why? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean, why? What are you talking about, why? She's like, why? I was like, and I just realized I was being emotional with her, you know? And so we brought Chloe in, and we shared with her, and we said, babe, the fish actually, they're not sleeping. They're actually dead. And she just, her eyes just got like this, and she just started welling up, and my heart was just like breaking into a million pieces, and she started crying, and, and then we, she brushed her teeth, and she was crying. She got in her bed and she was crying. We read her stories and she was crying. She, we prayed with her, she was crying. We left her in there and she cried. And she cried and she cried. She cried herself to sleep. She cried all night long. And it was hard, <laughs> it was hard. But the next week we finally got enough uh, courage to go back to pet, the pet land or pet store or whatever it was. And uh, we bought five new fish. And we put them in, the day later, four of them died again. Four of them died again, but, but Chloe was fine. She was fine, she handled it. She was sad, yes, but she handled it. And it was amazing because I could see, and it, was, it spoke to me so much about allowing the Lord to, to, to do something in people's lives. It's hard to go through things, and we want to protect people, we want to link with the emotions, and say, no, don't go through that, but to let the Lord do what he needs to do in her life, you know? And today we have one fish out of those second five. Her name is Samantha. She's still alive. It's a miracle because she, she's not even supposed to be able to survive without other fish, but she's there. She's in our living room. You can see her. So it's incredible. And, uh, and that's just a small thing, you know. It's big things, too. It's like my son, you know, he's, he's gone through a lot of stuff. He knows he's gone through 15 surgeries, hundreds of stays in the hospital, tons of stuff. And I knew from the beginning <laughs> that I needed to point him to the Lord. I needed to, I needed to say, my boy, <laughs> this is hard, but this is your road. This is the road that the Lord has for you. It's hard, yes, I know, but somewhere his grace will be for you. Somewhere, somewhere you're walking in his plan and his will. Don't be condemned. I know it's hard, and he's faced a lot of hard things. But along the way, I've been able to encourage him to just see the Lord and to pray to the Lord and see the Lord do miracles, and it's been incredible. But that's why we need to point each other to the Lord. Another area, let's go to Luke 9. Is rejection. Who likes to be rejected? Nobody likes to be rejected. I don't want to be rejected. I don't want to be invited to all the birthday parties and everything. I want, to, I want people to include me in everything. But we face rejection, you know, and that's just small stuff, but there's big things. And, and Jesus was rejected, <laughs> but to see his heart and how he responded to that rejection. So Luke 9, what did I say? Uh, verse 51. It says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him, the Samaritans did not receive him, because his face was set for the journey for, to Jerusalem. And, the, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, so, so the Samaritans wouldn't receive Jesus, and the disciples are all frustrated because you can't reject, this is Jesus, you're rejecting Jesus, you know? And they, and they said to Jesus, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? So these people, they wouldn't allow Jesus to come into their city. And, and the, the disciples are like, let's just burn them all with fire. They're rejecting you, Lord. That sounds like a good plan, you know? And that's like our initial reaction to, when, to rejection, right, is, is anger. We want to just consume, you know? And even when other people go through rejection, we say, oh, well, it shouldn't be like that. You need to fire back like that. And, you know, but this is Jesus' heart. He turned and he rebuked them. And he said, you don't even know what manner of spirit you are of. He said, you don't even know what you're talking about. You don't even know what you're saying. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So 
That's the heart of Jesus, rejected. He was, he was God. He was rejected. And he said, I didn't come to destroy these people. I came to save them. And how the Lord wants our hearts, even in rejection, to stay soft and to stay humble and to say, Lord, even if I'm rejected, even if I'm not invited to the birthday party, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'll keep my heart pure. And the Lord has made a way for us. He's shown us how to, how to be with other people. And it's that heart that we feel from him that motivates us to love others. There's another one in uh, Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 38. And it's about being taken advantage of. I don't want to be taken advantage of. Nobody wants to be taken advantage of, right? People to use us and take advantage of us. But I believe, this is my conviction, that if you're doing what the Lord puts on your heart, if you're doing what he's put there, it is impossible for you to be taken advantage of. Because no matter how the circumstance, no matter how people react, but it's impossible for you to be taken advantage of if you're doing what God is asking you to do. And um, in Matthew 5, 38, it says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to see you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. And that's, that's the heart of the Lord. You want to take something from me? Take it, and then here's more. <laughs> you want to use me? Take it, and then here's more, and I'll give my life even more for you because you're more important, even as you are, even as you taking advantage of me are more important than this thing that you're trying to take from me. And it's hard. It's a hard thing to get because in our flesh, it's not, it's not something that we, we want to do. It's something that we fight every day in our flesh. I remember I was playing basketball in a park when me and Julie were first married. And, uh, and it, it's a little park in, in California. And um, I used to do ride-alongs with this police officer. And every park in this area in Oceanside, Every park is ruled by a gang. You don't, you don't realize it, but some gang owns these little parks, you know, and I used to, and, and so I went to the park to play basketball, and a couple of these gang members came up and they wanted to play with me, and I was like, cool, wonderful, let's play. So we played basketball together and we had a good time. And then like six, seven other guys came and they sat on the bench, and on the bench was my little iPod shuffle. Remember those iPod shuffles that you can clip on and jog and stuff? I had one of those with some headphones. And and I remember we were playing, having a good time. I had a good, good time with those guys. And the guys were like moving closer to my iPod shuffle and they were looking at me and I, I could see them and they were moving closer and they were moving closer. And I could see that they wanted to steal the iPod, you know. And for me, I wasn't angry at all. I was just like, okay. I know these young kids, they have hard lives. They're going through things. They're trying to get acceptance from each other. They're probably trying to earn a little stripe from stealing something from somebody. You know, I, I know how it is. And I finally just went to the guys and I said, guys, if you want that, just take it. I said, just take it. If you want it, just take it. <laughs> I said, there's no problem. And they looked at me, they're like, you know, and then they got up and kind of dispersed and stuff. But honestly, in my heart, I didn't care about the iPod. These kids, man, they, they, it's hard. It's tough to live out there. It's tough to be a part of what they're a part of. Tough to be exposed to what they're exposed to. If you want the iPod, take the iPod. I'll go home and get you my, my other bigger iPod. Take it, you know, whatever, you know. But how the, we can't be taken advantage of when we serve the Lord. To, to, to when people take from us, our initial reaction is to say, uh-uh, that's it. But when they do, just go the extra mile for them. You know, we know it's part of the Christian life to suffer. It's a part of the Christian life to face rejection. It's part of the Christian life to face persecution. And a lot of times we think it's some far off thing, like if we go on a mission trip to Iraq and we're going to face persecution over there, but it happens here. It happens sometimes in our own homes. It happens sometimes in the church, sometimes in relationships here. But, and, 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 and we know that's part of our lives. And in 2 Timothy, let's just turn there real quick, just so you know that I'm not just making this stuff up. Let's see what it says here in the Bible. It says, yes, it says 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 12. 2 Timothy 3, 12 says, and yes, all who desire to live 
Godly in Christ Jesus, which is who? All of us, right? I want to be godly in Christ Jesus. It says, will suffer persecution. So it's not a strange thing when, when people come against us. It's not a strange thing when, when whatever rumors or issues or whatever come up. It's not a strange thing. Turn to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, 12. It says, Beloved, and just like I said, Beloved, do not think it some strange thing concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that which you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. And it says down, it says in 16, it says, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. It's not, it's not something to be ashamed of, to suffer. And just turn to 1 Peter 2, 19. And this verse here, this is the verse that kind of kills every argument of being justified, of standing my ground. Of, I've looked at this, I've, I've, I come back to this sometimes because we want to justify, we want, if we're falsely accused, if someone says something to us, accuses us of something, and, and it's not right, the first thing we want to do is justify ourselves. You know, we want to be our lawyer, we want to plead our case and say, no, 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 that's not, I'm not really like that. Someone said that about me, but no, 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 that's not the, that's not the reality of what's going on. But in 1 Peter 2, 9, or 2, uh, 19, it says, For this is commendable, if because of conscience towards God one, de- one endures grief, suffering uh, wrongfully. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults? You take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. It says, For it... To this you were called. It says, to this you were called, all of us, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us, as an, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to, those who, to, the, to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on that tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's a hard one. That's, a, that's one of the hardest, when I read the Bible, that's one of the hardest verses right there, is to, when you're being talked about, when things are going on, to take it patiently, to take it patiently. And it can happen in our own, in marriages, in our own homes, you know. It can happen anywhere, you know. We're not just talking about some far-off thing. But to not react, but to, but to know that it says Jesus is our example. And he's made that way for us to not revile in return. Even when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. And having a pure heart, I'll tell you what, is a full-time job. There's one thing that I could just focus on every day, all day, just to have a pure heart. Because you can come out of your room, and you've just been with, prayed to the Lord, and you're feeling all good, and you get in your truck, and you drive, and then turn on Bay Vista, and someone's going 15 and a 35, and your heart is just, mm-hmm. and, and then you go to the store, and you're at Lowe's, oh, and, and you go in there, and, and the people are taking a long time, and you're just like, mm-hmm, I'm in a hurry, and then all of a sudden, your heart, and then you go home, and by the time you go home, you're all riled up, and your kids say something to you, your wife says something to you, and then he's like, ah, and then you just, <laughs> it's just your heart, it just builds, you know? But to have a pure heart, oh, that's something that I need to have more. And we do that. There's times where I just have to go into my room, close the door, and I just sit there and I just say, Lord, I know that my heart is not well. I know that somewhere I've lost my peace, somewhere I've lost, I don't know what's going on. I have no idea, and I'm thick like that. I just don't know. Sometimes I don't even know what's, why I am the way I am. But I, I just say, Lord, help me. Show me what's in my heart. Show me what's wrong with me. Show me. And I just sit there, and he just reveals. You have an issue with that brother. You have an attitude with, to your kids or your wife. You have this. You have that. 
and I repent before the Lord. I say, Lord, forgive me. Give me the grace, Lord. And he gives me the grace, and I go out, and I repent to my wife. I repent to my kids. I repent to the brother if I need to repent to the brother, and I'm restored. And that's how the gospel works. It's, it's the Lord shows us, and it brings us to a place of repentance. And when we repent, it's done. Absolutely done. Matthew 7. Let's turn there real quick. Jumping around. This is a big one. We hear this a lot. And there's a... People have an idea of Christians. People who are not Christian, a lot of times when they hear the word Christian, there's one thing that pops into their head. It's the first word that pops into their head. And they say, hypocrite. (laughs) They say they do this one thing, but they're actually doing that. And the heart of the Pharisees, it says in the Bible, the Pharisees put burdens on people that they themselves wouldn't bear. And Matthew 7, it says, Judge not that ye not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. Now, I know this part of the verse very well because many times where I've judged people, it's, it's crazy. I've judged them for something. And then the next day, I go through the same situation, and I'm put into that same situation as I judged them for. And it's, it's, a bad, it's a hard feeling, and I've learned the hard way a lot of times that that verse is so true. When we cast judgment on people, it's like we're judged in the same way. And it says, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And that's the heart of the Lord, to help each other. If I see something in Joe's life that's not right or whatever, and I can't just come to him and say, Joe, this is wrong, pow, 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 you know, and just destroy him. I need to wait and be patient and say, Lord, do you want me to even speak to him? (laughs) Do you want me to share to him? Because I don't want to just come to this man and have have my advice for his life of what I think he should do. And somewhere, the Lord takes us through things. And if I have a struggle, and the Lord has given me a victory, I can come to him and say, Joe, I've had the same struggle. I've had the same issue. And I just want to let you know that the Lord can help you. That if you turn your eyes to the Lord, if you turn your heart to the Lord, he can deliver you. But I'm here for you. But I'm not anything above you. I'm actually struggled with it myself. And that's the heart of the Lord, to help each other, to remove that speck. It's like, it's like the Lord is taking the log out of mine, and I can just gently and carefully help you to take that speck out of yours, not destroy you with the Bible or with what I think is right, you know? Because each one of us is so precious to the Lord, and we can't compare. I can't compare myself to Titan. I can't compare myself to Emma. I can't compare. We can't compare. Because the moment we compare, what happens? Okay, Brad, okay, I'm going to compare myself to him. Now now we're comparing, now we're in competition, you know, because I'm trying to be better than him, he's trying to be better than me, okay? And the moment you get into competition, what does that lead to? Division. (laughs) Because you can't compete, there's two sides. When you're competing, there's two sides competing. But it all starts with that comparing. If we compare with each other, then it goes to competition, then it goes to division. So it's best to squash that right in the beginning and not compare with each other. The Lord, we, we're each precious to one another. We each have a road that we need to walk and to encourage each other, to point each other to the Lord and just to, to, to be a support. <laughs> and even if you're struggling with something that I used to struggle with, doesn't mean I should just tell you, you know. I just want to be sensitive to what the Lord puts on my heart to encourage brothers and sisters. But there's, a, there's an amazing tool, guys, that we have in our relationships. And it's repentance and forgiveness. Those are the greatest tools that we have in our relationship. Let's look at 1 John. And this is where we see the heart of Jesus for us. And this is what I want to have. I need the Lord to give me more and more. In verse 8, it says, if we, have, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from most of our unrighteousness. All right? <laughs> cleanse us from most of it, but it, to keep a little file just in case, right? No. 
It says he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. When we come before him and we break our hearts before him and we say, forgive me, everything is gone, it's finished. Yeah, even when we come before each other, sometimes it's like, yeah, I forgive you. Wait, what, did, what are you repenting for? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, no, cool, okay. No, nah, yeah, I forgive you. But write that down. Okay, put it in the file. <laughs> and we keep a little bit of something sometimes with each other. But the heart of Jesus, he lets it go. It's all gone. And to have that heart with each other is, is to have a pure heart and to have a heart that's forgiving each other in our relationships. There's nothing better than that. I mean, there's nothing better than that. Because unforgiveness is, it is something that will, will, will rot us from the inside out. You know, I remember one time Chloe was uh, upset because she had done something to Nicholas or said something. He didn't even know what it was. And we were, I, was, I was tucking them in. We were telling a story at, at bedtime. And uh, she was crying. She was crying because she felt so bad for what she had done. And I remember I just said, just tell him you're sorry. It's OK. It's OK. And she said, no, I can't. I can't. I'm just sorry. And Nicholas is on the other side of the bed. He's like, what's going on over there, you know? And she, and, and she told him that, you know, I'm sorry I've done something, but I can't tell you what it is. And he said, Chloe, he said, I don't care what you did. It doesn't matter what you did. You could have done anything. I'll forgive you. Just tell me. I'll forgive you. It doesn't matter, you know? And I just heard that, and I was like, oh, you know? Like, I was like, man, Lord, that's your heart for us, and I want to have that heart for other people. It's like, it doesn't matter what you've done to me. I can forgive you, but... Did you know that we don't even have to, people don't even have to come re to repent to us for us to forgive them? I think that's a big thing sometimes. They're like, well, as soon as they come to me, then I'll forgive them, you know? And then meanwhile, we hold it for years and years and years until that day, I and mean, that day may never come. But we can forgive each other, even without them coming to us and saying they're sorry. And that's, that's a freedom right there. That's a freedom where the Lord can lift <laughs> that unforgiveness off of our hearts. Last Sunday, came in here, and I walked in, and the guys were in the booth, Randy and Joe and, and Richard, and they set up this little table back there where Tamron is right now. And I walked in, and for whatever reason, because for three years we've been having three people up there, and I walked in, and I saw the table there, and I'm like, guys, what's this table doing here, you know? And I saw the wires, and I just didn't like it, and I, I kind of gave them an attitude, and it wasn't a big deal, but, but we started to, but I could tell, they could tell I was frustrated, and, <laughs> and, uh, so I come up, and we're worshiping, and a song and a half into it, the Lord's just like, mm, you need to put that right. And I'm like, Lord, that's not that big of a deal. And I'm just, okay, anyway. And so then it just, mm, 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 mm. I was like, oh, okay. So in the middle of worship, I walked back there, went to Joe, went to Randy, and said, guys, I'm sorry. I, I had a bad attitude towards you. I shouldn't have said that, and I'm sorry. And then I went over to uh, Richard, who was there, said the same thing, I'm sorry. But it cleared the air, finished, done. And the Lord, the Lord builds, our, builds our relationships like that. It's like, I can't be so afraid to say I'm sorry because what happens now? Now, I've got a little attitude with those guys because of what they did. And he has an attitude with me because I was having an attitude with him. And, but when you repent, it clears the air. It's finished. It's done, you know? Let's go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, uh, yeah, 21. In this verse, it says, You have heard it said that those of old you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in, the danger, in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar, go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, then come back and offer your gift. And it, that's why, guys, we got to have our hearts clear. And we know we can have little attitudes, little issues, and we can say, oh, it's not a big deal. But they're like little foxes in the vineyard. The Bible talks about that. Come in and they destroy the vineyard. They don't seem like a big deal, but they destroy it. And that's why we have to search our hearts and say, Lord, who do I have something against? Show me so that I can repent, so I can be restored. Even 
even Samuel, even uh, David and Samuel, you know, uh, David and Saul, you know, Saul was trying to kill, and, and Rod touched on this on Thursday night. Saul was trying to kill David. We know that, right? He was trying to kill David, coming after him. And David was in a place where he could have killed Saul. 1 Samuel 24, just read that real quick. So David had him in a place where he could, so Saul's been after him, Saul's, Saul's been trying to kill him. Why shouldn't David kill this man? Why shouldn't he? He's trying to kill him. But this is what David said when he had him surrounded. Verse 24, verse 6, he said, And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went his way. And this is Saul's response. He said, You are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. And you have shown this day how you have dealt with well with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hand, you did not kill me. <laughs> Amazing to feel that hard, huh? And it just speaks to me how even when people are against me, even when there's issues, even when there's attitudes, Lord, let me have a heart still, your heart towards people, to know that they belong to you. They're your children. Who am I to say anything about Joe? How can I say anything? How can I gossip about Joe? How can I say anything about him? He's the child of God. <laughs> How can I do that? Yet sometimes we get just so easy. It's our culture just to talk, 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 and say things and gossip and blah, 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 and we don't care what comes out of our mouth, but we need to be careful. It's very important. And Stephen, in the book of Acts, when he's getting stoned, what did he say to, those, to, those, to the Lord when he was getting stoned? He said, Lord, do not charge them with this. <laughs> he's getting stoned. And the very people who are killing him, he says, do not charge them with this. And one of the last verses here says, uh, Luke 23. What did Jesus say? He's our example, guys. Jesus is getting crucified on the cross. And this is his heart. He said, in verse 34, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. He's getting crucified. And I tell you, those people who persecute you, those people who, who are against you, those people who, 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 who you feel like are your adversaries, through the heart that Jesus has for you, through your heart for them, one day they'll be standing next to you in church and you'll be worshiping the Lord together. It's incredible. And that's the heart of the Lord. That's what the heart of the Lord can do. And when we endure and we say, Lord, I don't care if they, what they've said against me. I don't care what they've done, Lord. My heart is for them, for them to know you, for them to be saved, for them to come to you, for them to be standing next to me in church. It's incredible. It opens the door. I'm just go back to John 13, last verse here. Where's Matt? Sorry, Dad. Matt, do you want to come up here? And I hope that this morning that we felt a little bit more of what the heart of Jesus is for us and what he's calling us to. And have I, am I here? No. <laughs> I've got a long way to go. I'm not, I haven't made it there at all. But that's the gospel. And what's preached from the pulpit needs to be the gospel. And that's what we want to go. And we're becoming more and more like Christ. The Bible says we're prede predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ, for there to be less of me and more of him. And I want to not just be more like him for myself, but to be more like him so that I can have a heart like him for others. And just back to John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And it says, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Amen. So maybe this morning, let's just pray. And we'll sing a song and just to spend some time before the Lord. Maybe we can just stand. And I just want to encourage you guys and encourage myself just to spend some time this morning.
to just be before the Lord, to let him search our heart. If we have something against a brother, if we have something against a sister, whether they're here or not, if we have unforgiveness in our heart, people have done things to us, people have said things to us that have bothered us, it might have been in middle school, <laughs> it might have been in high school, whatever it may be, but there's things in our hearts that we just, we just don't want to let go. This morning I want to encourage you, bring your heart to the Lord. Let Him help you let it go. It's not worth hanging on to. It's not worth having these little attitudes and relationships because it robs us from the life of Christ. So this morning, let's just sing a song. Let's put our hearts before the Lord. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your grace in our lives, Lord. We thank you for the example you are to us. First, Lord, we thank you that you came and died for us. And as we, even as Christians, we mess up, Lord. But your heart for us is to restore us, to forgive us, to be long-suffering, to be patient, to be kind, Lord. That's your heart for us, Lord. And out of that overflow of how you are with us, Lord, help us to be like that with others, Lord. To carry your heart, to be your aroma to this world, Lord. Show us this morning, Lord, in our hearts, Lord, what's not right. There's been other people in our lives that have hurt us, Lord. There's been other people in our lives who we've hurt, Lord. Help us, Lord, to see. Thank you, Jesus.